respected director cpmb dean school of post graduate studies and our guest speaker of this evening dr udpal nath from indian institute of science bangalore president heads of uh, biochemistry senior faculty members and other faculty members of cpmb student friends good evening to all so i welcome you all for this uh, endowment lecture uh, by dr udpal nath uh, he is a professor in indian institute of science working in department of microbiology and cell biology actually he is an alumni of uh, tnau he did his uh, msc in biotechnology in the year 89 to 91 and uh, then he did his uh, phd in a uh, tata in institute of fundamental research and then he went for his uh, post doctoral program in cambridge university and uh, later on he again moved into uh, indian institute of science as a faculty that is as associate pro professor in the year uh, 2010 and then till uh, 2021 he was as associate professor now he is working as a professor in developmental biology uh, and basically he is working on model plant arabidopsis in uh, morphogenesis of leaves and in working on basic sciences and uh, his um, publications are uh, in most cited journals about of more than 34 Uh, with uh, six review chapters and one books with uh, citation index in the h index of uh, more than 20 and uh, he is also readily uh, he wants to collaborate with us on uh, certain uh, basic studies as well as applied genetics involving the leaf morphogenesis and other aspects now uh, we will have his lecture uh, of this uh, endowment lecture for this evening uh, good evening to all uh, Professor Nigat Biotechnology, uh, Biochemistry, and senior faculty and students, uh, both online and offline. I am really happy today. Uh, one of our, one of my senior, uh, my neighbor in the room in the PG hostel, and uh, the person who teach me on biochemistry, so complex sub subject. is a very interesting teacher so he will teach the juniors very nicely in the hostels so whenever i have things and i will refer to him and i will get doubt on that so even though the most complex biochemistry been very simply upal will teach uh, along with that upal uh, uh, another two people are there uh, only one settled in jnu another one in fci uh, so the people are they they went to different walks of life and uh, so he is uh, moved in uh, still is in the basic uh, basic science and really happy that uh, upal is come over here and uh, to talk to our students and uh, Uh, since uh, since his beginning is much interested on the leaf anatomy and the leaf architecture the trite still is continuing on this trite it's really a interesting trite uh, usually uh, the uh, plant breeders and the people working on domestication they try to modify the leaf uh, plant architecture in some way, some way to make a better yield or make a crop to particular particular trite is suitable for particular location so we modified many uh, many of the trites based on the human needs by that the many architectural been changed like maize from tos into uh, single stem maize present day corn and similarly the tillering and many trites been modified so now people now looking on the how to go back to a uh, look, look like cotton they have uh, many branching now they want to have single stem with less monopodia so they want to change that architecture so the architecture changes because uh, some earlier days we need a more robust growth wider area coverage but now because of mechanical harvesting and the labor shortage the people want to change the plant architecture so so the less studies like the domestication trite or the some of the trites which are key which definitely will totally change the entire uh, leaf, to totally plant architecture sometimes uh, maybe 100 years or 1000 years back this architecture may not be suitable now this architecture is need of the day so that that's why the the people working on the basic uh, genes which regulate the architectural trite like leaf morphology or the plant architecture definitely will be interesting one because everybody now looking for the genes for editing genome editing tools come in a big way so now they are looking for which gene to edit but the people like opal working on the very long period the he know the which are all the master switch gene which if we edit it we can uh, totally change the system 
so this way the this kind of uh, uh, key traits definitely in the application science is more interesting and definitely gives uh, the rich experience the indian institute of science for the last 3 4 decades uh, on the this kind of basic traits working on arab abscess system and try to apply in the plant system definitely will help us so really your lecture definitely will uh, motivate our students to take up uh, uh, research in a little bit longer career because many people nowadays uh, uh, losing interest on the basic science taking a basic research taking a long path on the Uh, research career is uh, nowadays even government of india asking us to go for entrepreneurship go for in a way uh, startup companies so many things now coming so even smaller thing they want to make it a uh, companies and do some product something like that but uh, the people like you the working on the basic uh, research definitely will motivate our student to take up a long career in research this is needed for the for, for in india because Uh, make in india or the innovate india all unless you have innovation you cannot make it make the things happen so uh, definitely your lecture definitely will uh, motivate us and also the, also not only the students our faculty also though those who are looking for the some of the funding on basic research definitely will give some idea on that so with that small note i welcome you for this Uh, today endowment lecture and we are happy that tamil nadu agriculture university and our vice chancellor is uh, so happy enough to be to take uh, the leading scientist from the top uh, in indian institute to here in coimbatore and talk to our students i am welcome for this uh, this endowment lecture thank you good afternoon and it's great to be here it's uh, 1989 to 1991 that uh, we were here uh, me and uh, my 11 to 12 uh, batchmates three of us uh, were from uh, west bengal uh, as uh, professor kokledu mentioned me ashish nandi who is in jnu and uh, bisujit rai who has a company in bangalore so uh, three bongs conglomerated here we in short we call bonglomeration anyway so uh, uh, before th- so after finishing this i did a, um, a phd in tfr in an entirely different subject protein biophysics and then i came back to um, plant science which is my alma mater again in uh, my postdoc uh, in uh, england in john inner center and that is where i got interested in leaf morphogenesis so i'll talk you some uh, you know aspect of leaf, mor- leaf morphogenesis raise some questions to the students because the the main premise of science is asking question whether you get answer or not it doesn't really matter are you asking the right questions or not because if if you that that is the first point so the question that i ask is is this is the following so we we grow right all of us grow animals plants i'm talking about the physical growth uh, not spiritual or uh, not moral growth uh, the physical growth what do you need for physical growth you need several resources for example you definitely need air to breathe you need water that is the you know the basic of life uh, of life you need light more so for plant but animal also needs light you need nutrient to eat which you had some time ago but you also need another resource which you, you often do not give importance to and that is space the space is very important where do i grow to if i don't have space how do i grow right and if you are not convinced the space is important get stuck in a lift for half an hour and you will know what space means you need space you want to come out and then you know in in open space so plant needs to fill space to find out and to extract where is the pointer where is the pointer plant need space to to ha- harvest these air water light and uh, nutrient and other resources to the best of its capability so that it can grow right so it has to fill the space how does it fill the space when you talk about space then you have to ask that what is space and how many dimensions of space is there do you know how many dimensions of space is there i'm asking the students three dimensions are there right but we have studied in geometry that there is one dimension also 
a straight line, right? Does a straight line really exist? Can you draw a straight line for me? A true straight line according to definition? You cannot. Because a straight line according to definition should have only length but no width. Can you draw a straight line without any width? No matter how fine your pen or pencil is, there will be still some width. So one dimension is not a reality. Right? It is a mathematical concept. Similarly, two dimension, which is a surface, is also not a reality. It is a mathematical fantasy. Two dimension. You give me an object of two dimension. No matter how thin your paper is, it still has some thickness. So it is a three dimension. So everything in this world is three dimension. So when I say that we plants fill the space, I'm talking about a three dimensional space. The question is, how does it fill the three dimensional space to harvest the other resources? This is what I'm going to talk about and come to the leaf morphogenesis after that. Look at this plant. It has actually filled space in three dimension, but it's such a dumb way of filling the space. Why am I saying that is not a very intelligent of filling the space? Because you see the surface area and see the volume. Surface area to volume ratio is so low, isn't it? Because it's not branching, right? It's a, it's a, it's a, a sphere, it's a spheric structure, it's a sphere. So if the where do you get these resources from? You, where do the you, you do you get this absorb these resources from from the surface right and you feed that resources into the volume surface is so low because we know that a sphere has minimum surface right when it becomes a, a, a cube it has more surface so this is not a nice way of of growing it why is it still surviving well it has other adaptive advantage for growing like that so you need to fill the space in a much better way much more intelligent way what is that so take about stem. A stem grows in mostly one dimension. I'm ignoring the width of the of the stem. So suppose consider it is growing in one dimension. How is it growing? It has one evolutionary, uh, you know, innovation. What is that innovation of growth, growing the stem? It has some differentiated tissue. Why does it have to grow towards the top? Because well, light is all the top. So if I grow down, I won't get light. If I grow this way, I won't get light. For the best light capturing, I should grow tall. And if I have to grow tall, then I should grow in one dimension first, right? So that I can reach the light from underground, come out of the ground, and then I can spread my leaf and other things. So it has to grow in one dimension first. This is one dimensional growth. Linear growth or Z axis, my height, that's the Z axis. This is X axis and this is 90 degree Y axis, right? So how does it grow? It grows by putting some differentiated tissue like in yellow it's shown here in one dimension and at the tip it is a very different kind of cell called stem cell or meristem the simplest way of growing stem cells will divide add new cells into the differentiated tissue which is stem and it will keep on growing in one dimension right you can compare with the matchstick suppose this gunpowder here is or, or here is the stem cell and this is the differentiated cell which is making the stem it will keep on growing in one dimension but that's not a nice way of growing in one dimension keep on growing in meters you are not really covering the space because there is so many other space in two other dimensions that is x-axis and y-axis that as, as i said so how does it how can you change the growth in one dimension to growth into two dimension for example right so it does in a very uh you know innovative way First, it does it, it splits the stem cell into two. Okay, suppose. And now you grow. So, see, from one dimension, now it has become to, gone to two dimension, which is X and Z axis. So, this is the Z axis and this is the X axis. It still has not gone into, grown into the Y axis, which is from you through the screen into the other side. That is the 90 degree Y axis. And you repeat the same thing because plant is a very repetitive organism. So, you repeat itself. You repeat itself. In geometry, this is called fractal geometry, fractal growth. 1 to 2, 2 to 4, 4 to 8, 8 to 16, right? If you keep on doing that, see, very simple question. Split your stem cell into two and grow. Split again and grow. Split again and grow. From by Simply by doing this from one dimension, now you are covering a two dimension. Not good enough because you have to grow in three dimension, right? How do you grow in three dimension? Again, you have an, another evolutionary innovation. That is, 
in this uh, node here where it is branching, you make a turn a little bit, say 90 degree, 45 degree, doesn't matter. What will happen? Now you are invading into the three dimension, right? You understand? This is two dimension. And now if I turn this one, suppose this is bifurcates, and if I turn this one and grows this way, now I'm invading into three dimension. This also does the same thing. This also does the same thing. So if you keep on turning at every node, then you will invade into three dimension. Now you have completed, you have completely filled the space of three dimension through which light and air can go very easily and you have plenty of light and uh, you have the volume the same, but your surface area is huge so that you can uh, you, you can you can cover, you know, you, you, you can get. Uh, did I say something wrong? Why this insect is bothering me? Yeah, so uh, now you have, you know, uh, uh, intelligently filled the space so that you can get the other. This is what, uh, you know, made in uh, in a modeling I've taken stolen from Google. Uh, this is what a three dimensional structure. Isn't it looks like a, 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 the way a tree grows? This is a, a tree in front of the aerospace department in IAC. You see how nicely it has filled a three dimensional space. Lots of air inside, lots of so that it can exchange oxygen and uh, carbon dioxide. It can you know, get plenty of, uh, of sunlight. This is how trees evolved for the first time in evolution. There's no leaf. Leaf came later. First, stem was uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, innovated and stem uh, kept on branching and made a plant like that. Remember this plant, Silotum? This is still extant plant. It is still present on, on this earth and there is no leaf at all. Forget about this round thingy. These are sexual uh, you know, uh, uh, structures. You see it, it bifurcates, it bifurcates, it bifurcates, it bifurcates and it covers uh, very nicely. Not good enough. You have filled the space, but you have to harvest the sunlight to the best of your capability. This is not very good. For that, you have to grow in three dimensions, in two dimension, like expand in the flat in two dimension and orient the leaf towards the sun. You can get the maximum uh, sunlight. How did that innovation happen? And I told you that this kind of growth came first in evolution. Leaf came later. How did leaf evolve from this structure like this? I'll tell you how it evolved. Leaf is, so this is a planar growth, right? This I already discussed. Uh, how stem uh, covers the 3D, and this is the planar growth. It, it it comes out of the meristem, but at the axil, at the 90 degree angle, at the at the lateral organ. And this is the surface, which is the largest biological surface on Earth. Not animal body surface, but is the is the leaf that makes the maximum surface. And that is because you know you have to harvest as much as sunlight that it needs for its growth. How did leaf evolve? You see, the, within leaf there is a. a, a, a structure which bifurcates and makes a very uh, brown structure, isn't it? And looking at this, somebody actually made something like that, that there is a tree within a uh, within a leaf. And that is so true because leaf apparently originated from stem. How did it originate? There is a guy called, uh, so, so it, it, this is a, a, an ancestral leaf, ancestral uh, plant, suppose, and a single leaf originated in evolution from a single branch. How did it grow? I'll show you how it grew. There is a guy called Zimmerman right, in, in uh, Germany. He came up with a theory which is so plausible. I don't know if it's possible or not, but it is so plausible. So what he said is that initially, the it was only stem was there, in the, as I told you. Leaf were not evolved and it branched once, then it branched again, it branched again, so on and so forth. You can fill the 3D space, okay, with that whatever that evolutionary innovation I've spoken to you about. But each and every branch is equal. This one is same as this one. This one is equal to this one. Nobody is bigger than anybody else. All equal, right? What happened is at some point during evolution, there is something happened called overtopping. Overtopping means this guy, this branch says that I am bigger than you. All are equal, but some are more equal than others. So this is more equal than others. Okay, this is called overtop, overtopping. Overtopping happens not only in uh, in plant, but it happened in human society also. Not only I will grow, I will not let you grow, so that you know I look bigger, right? So this it became uh, you know big dada in 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 this plant, and it started suppressing the growth of this one. This is actually origin of apical dominance. I will grow as main branch. You are subsidiary to me. 
your axillary branch. Right? So, and, and you know that that's actually true because when you cut the top, the axillary branch started, starts coming, right? So this is called overtopping. After the overtopping, what happens is a, a step called planation. You see these branches? They're in three dimension, like that, okay? Then what happened is all these branches became in two dimension. I'm talking about something which probably happened in several millions, in hundreds of millions, millions of years. It became in, three, in two dimension called planation. And after the planation has happened in this branch, you can put some soft, nice tissue in between and connect them. You got a leaf, isn't it? Because if you put some nice soft tissue here, it'll look like a leaf. So leaf originated actually from the stem a branch, an entire branch. And you can today, still you can see that within the leaf there are branched branches and there are like stem-like structures, which is actually vasculature. And for each of these step, there is fossil evidences that plant, actually, uh, in fact, you know, uh, the leaf, in fact, originated like that, right? If leaf originated like that, it is true, then there must have been some genes which have been recruited here in this step, recruited here in this step, and recruited here in this step. If those genes are really involved in making a leaf, if you mutate them, you should be able to go back, convert a leaf to a stem, right, in two dimension. Then stem two dimension to stem three dimension. And finally, you have a silotum-like plant which has no leaves at all. It's only branching and branching. Can you do that? What are those genes? So how do you identify these genes? By mutation. Mutation is principle of elimination or principle of exclusion. I'll tell you what. There is noise is being generated in this room. I can hear. It is coming from me, actually. I'm generating. But if you don't know who is generating this noise, how will you know? By randomly, one by one, you can ask the and one person, can, can you go out? The moment you send me out, the noise will stop. Right? The no, by noise, I'm saying whatever the blabbering that I'm doing. So, that means I was actually producing the noise. This is called mutation. Mutated gene, the gene is gone, function is gone, some phenotype is gone, right? That you all know. Now you bring me back again, noise comes back. That is called molecular complementation. Bring, the back, bring back the gene again. So you mutate and then see if you can convert a leaf into a partial you know, stem-like structure. Only then this, uh, this theory of uh, telome, I don't know why this it hasn't come. It's called telome theory, T-E-L-E-O-M, okay? T-E-L-O-M-E, -E, sorry, T-E-L-O-M-E, telome theory. So now I'll tell you that how the leaves are, do they already look like partly stem or they, they, they look like only a single leaf? All the leaves, if you put them together, they are grouped into two major groups. One is called simple leaf, uh, called Arabidopsis, Thaliana, Antriana, Majors, both are actually model systems. They're simple leaf. What does simple leaf mean? There is only one uh, lamina. They are not branched at all. And you have another group of leaf called compound leaf, like cardamine hirsuta. This is one. This is actually a close cousin of Arabidopsis. Both belong to the Brassicaceae. And tomato, which is Solanaceae that you know. Both of them are simple leaf. Why do I call them simple leaf? Because in a single leaf, there are multiple leaflets are there, which are separated far away. It is a compound leaf. But then you can argue that why are you calling this as a compound leaf? Maybe this is a leaf and this is a leaf and this is a leaf. You know, there are all five different leaves are there. It's not true because when they originate, all these leaves originate at, as a single simple structure. I'll show you. So this is uh, an Arabidopsis thaliana plant. You are seeing from the top, okay? Its stem cell or the meristem is right here. And if you blow it up by scanning electron micrograph, they look something like this, okay? This is the stem cell or the meristem, and leaves are being generated at the axil or at the lateral uh, uh, or the site. This is one leaf, which is the oldest here. The older one are removed here. And this is the younger than that. This is another one here. This is another one here. And then it will keep on, you know, growing in this, right? And the, the newest one will come probably somewhere here. This region is the stem cell region. It will never get converted to any organ. These cells always remain stem cell and do not differ get differentiated into anything. And that happens because a group of transcription factor called NOX, K-N-O-X, they are expressed here in this region, okay? And other group of uh, proteins are expressed here and ensure that it makes a leaf. Okay, so this is the simplest 
you know, partitioning of the meristem so that the new leaf, after some time, the flower will come in this in this place instead of leaf when the uh, plant has taken the transition from vegetative to, to reproductive. So this is how the leaf or originated. And this leaf, so both the leaves, whether it's simple or compound, all of them originate orig originate like this, a single structure, just like a, you know, a, 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 like a sim simple peg, peg-like structure. And that happens because uh, a, a, a group of gene which is expressed here is called Knox gene. And this is shown as a reporter gene. You know what reporter genes are? And in this case, it is GUS. GUS or glucuronidase or a beta glucuronidase, whatever. Wherever you see, this is a transgenic arabidopsis plant, very young plant. You are seeing the two youngest leaves are here, and these two are cotyledons here, and this is the hypocotyl. Here, this NOx gene, which is expressed only in the meristem, has been cloned. The upstream region of that, or regulatory region, has been cloned with an enzyme producing gene called GUS. Wherever there is blue color, that NOx gene, NOx promoter is active. So here, where this NOx promoter is active, only in the meristem. It is not expressed anywhere else. You see, in this entire leaf, it is not there. However, this is a simple leaf. This is NOx1, but there are several other NOx genes are there. All of them are expressed in the meristem. However, so, and because of this, the leaf is simple. There is no compoundness or no leaf uh, division at all. However, in its cousin called Cardamine hirsuta, very early on, this is the meristem. It is like Nox is expressing here, but is also expressed at the base of the leaves. So in a simple leaf, the Nox gene is Nox 1, by the way. Nox 1 is expressed only in the meristem. And in the compound uh, leaf, it is not expressed not only in the meristem, but is at the base of the leaf. And finally, when this leaf grows, you get a compound leaf. Now, does it mean that this extra expression of the no NOx is responsible for making this compound leaf? Not necessarily. It can be a cause or it can be an effect, right? So you can't really conclude from this experiment that this extra expression of NOx, NOx1, is responsible for this or causal for this one. Maybe it's just a consequence. Something else is the responsible. Remember, your your conclusion in science should always be as much as your data supports, not more than that. You should not conclude more, more than what the data supports. And there's a very nice story that I uh, like to tell uh, to students is the story goes like this, that a physicist, a mathematician, and a philosopher are traveling together in the same compartment in Scotland. Okay. Uh, and... Uh, they see that outside in the field, there is a sheep, which is black in color. And the physicist concludes that sheep in black, uh, sheep in Scotland are black. I never knew that. They're all black sheep. The mathematician says that's not a nice conclusion, not correct conclusion, because you are seeing only one sheep. Maybe other sheep are not black. The philosopher says that also is not a good, correct conclusion. The only conclusion you can draw is there is at least one field in Scotland which has at least one sheep whose at least one side is black because you're not seeing the other side, right? Actually true. So conclusion should be only as much as the data shows. So just because there is extra expression doesn't mean that this is you know, responsible for that. There's a causal. How do you know that? Well, modify it, right? Manipulate it. For example, reduce the expression so that it is only here and not here and then see whether leaf shape changes or not or extend it here towards the uh, distal side and see whether it becomes more complex or not that can be done because both these species are uh, model species and they can be easily modified easily transgenic can be uh, uh, generated so this is what was done this is a cardamine wild type cardamine leaf it has nox gene the expression pattern i showed you in the previous slide, if you reduce the NOx gene from the leaf and restrict only in the meristem, it gets converted into a simple leaf. Now you can say that the NOx gene expression is responsible for making a compound leaf because when you reduce it and remove from the leaf, you can see that you can convert a compound leaf into a simple leaf. But is it sufficient? How do you do the test of sufficiency? Okay, this particular one is in RNAi. That is right, that is right. 
So here, actually, you reduce this is RNA interference. So general expression level goes down because there is a at the leaf level it's less. It becomes zero. Zero. So you can actually generate by RNA a different level of expression, of very low, very you know, uh, almost none, and so on and so forth. But this tells you that this this Knox expression is responsible for making it compound. Is it sufficient or not? For that, you introduce more. You know, truckload of uh, of this uh, uh, protein by overexpression. So this is 35 years. You all know what 35 years is. It's a uh, it's a constitutive promoter which is expressed in all the space, all the time, in huge amount. So remember, 35 years is doing three different things. Spatially, it is everywhere, almost. It is all the time because some promoter is active now, but not in the morning. Right, there are circadian rhythm uh, promoters, and it is lot of amount. So when you do that, you look at the leaf; it is hyper compound, more compound. So here it is more maximum Knox gene. Here it is middle, and here it is less. So it depends on the gradient, how much it is. It's a uh, it's a concentration. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, depends on the concentration. Higher, more compoundness; lower, uh, simple. It's not only in cardamine. It happens in other compound leaf uh, species as well. For example, tomato. This is a wild type tomato leaf. It also has Knox genes, the homologs of them. And they are expressed not only in the meristem, but also at the base of the leaf very early on. If you reduce this Knox gene and restrict only in the meristem, this is a tomato leaf. Can you believe this is a tomato leaf? It looks like Arabidopsis, isn't there? This is a tomato leaf. It's a simple leaf. So in here also, if you reduce the Knox gene, don't ask me how they reduced it. They actually took one promoter which is expressed in the in the leaf region, and they did the uh, uh, converted the Knox transcriptional activator into a transcriptional transcriptional repressor by adding one uh, uh, promoter uh, uh, one protein um, uh, domain called SRDX. Anyway, never mind. So basically, you know, suffice to say that Knox is normal here. Nox is less here. You have you have converted from compound to simple. You increase the Nox gene in tomato. Look at that. This is a single tomato leaf. All these work are done by mostly in in Israel, but in other uh, groups also. Lots of so more the uh, Nox gene, more is the complexity. Less the no Nox gene, the less is the complexity. So you can convert a compound leaf into either simple or uh, uh, you know more compound. What about in the simple leaf? Because we know that the Arabidopsis and Trianum, they are simple leaves. Antirandum majors is very difficult to transform. Arabidopsis is so easy. So overexpress these NOX1 genes or the stem, stem cell genes in Arabidopsis. This is normal. You can't make it more simple, right? Because it's already simple. A compound leaf can be simple and more complex. Whereas simple can't be simpler, but it can be converted into a compound. So overexpress the NOX1 genes and then see whether it is getting. Can you do you call it compound? I don't call it compound. You can compound, you can you can call it a lobed leaf, but it is a simple leaf because compound is only when this dissection goes all the way down to the midrib and separates one to the other. This kind of simple leaf is you know present even in the maple leaf is also a simple leaf, right? So you cannot convert a simple leaf into a compound leaf by overexpressing. You can change the shape changes a little bit, it becomes lobe, but not compound leaf. The question is that why you cannot, even though you are increasing, you, why can't you convert into the compound leaf? So compound can be converted into simple or more compound. But what is already simple, you cannot convert into compound leaf. The question is why, right? Is there something in the simple leaf uh, uh, leaf area that it is not letting the NOx function at all? Stay there, don't come into the leaf domain. Very strong message that don't come here. And if it is so, then what are those genes, right? So this is what, are, are there any gene already known uh, which are expressed in the leaf and then uh, does not uh, and suppresses the Nox one? I will talk about it. In this meristem, which I have already spoken about, a, a, a scanning electron micrograph, this is the stem cell region or the shoot apical meristem region. And here, I and so simple leaf is initiated like that. And I told you, that the compound leaf also is initiated like that. You see this? This is a single tomato leaf. This is a little older, so you can see the leaflet is coming out. But early on, this one and this one looks pretty similar. Forget about the hair-like structure. There's a trichome that you know that, right? But this is a single leaf, and 
this exactly looks like the, the uh, simple leaf. But later on, if you wait for a day or two, this one will make, see, see there's a leaflet here. So initially they're simple. Later on, probably NOx genes are expressed at the base and that's where they're making the leaflets. And here it is not expressing, probably there are some strong genes are there in the simple leaf, not letting the NOx gene uh, uh, express into the, into the leaf. What are those? So this is the meristem where I told you that these are NOx ones. It promotes the stemness only in this area. And this is the leaf where not only NOx1 does not express, there is certain transcription factor and the important transcription factors or important genes, they never come alone. They come as a group, right? They are called homologs. Many of them do the same function. What is it called? Redundancy, right? Functional redundancy. Remove one gene, you see a little bit of phenotype. Remove two genes, little more. Remove three genes, little more. So keep on removing one and one after another. Suppose there are five genes doing together, remove all five, you get the knockout phenotype. So there are many TCP genes are expressed only in the leaf. There are many NOx2 genes are expressed only in the leaf and they induce the leaf differentiation. The question is, is it possible that either TCP genes or NOx2 genes, they are suppressing the NOx1 genes into the leaf? Remember, the, note that I have called this one NOx and this one NOx. That means they may be similar, no? This, they are indeed a similar. These NOx genes, they are homeodomain transcription factors. These are also homeodomain transcription factors. Both of them originated from the same gene in evolution. Later on, two groups became separate. This one does the stemness function, and this one does the opposite of that. Uh, you, we have the, you know, uh, the example in our mythology itself. You know, the Kauravs and Pandavs, they do opposite things. So even though they are cousins, they do very different jobs. So is it possible that either TCP or NOx2 or both of them, they are suppressing and restricting the NOx1 here in simple leaf? If that is true, by force somehow, if we express NOx1 genes into this leaf region, can you convert a simple leaf into compound one? How do you do that? Remember, we have expressed by 35 years this NOx1 in Arbidopsis, you fail to convert into compound leaf. Now, can I reduce these genes one after another because there are multiple. And is, will it be that NOx1 genes will be expressed in this region and start making compound? Let's see what happens. Where does it, and, and this is the differentiation zone. This is the stem cell zone. In between the boundary, there's a kind of boundary genes is expressed. One name is CUC, cup shaped cotyledon. These are also transcription factors. But there are other CUCs also. There are three CUCs, CUC1, CUC2, CUC3. They're expressed only in the boundary region. It's quite interesting. It's almost like, uh, you know, India, and Western, uh, our Western neighbor, and there is a, a line of control in between, right? So this is the, the kind of gene expression pattern in, in the meristem. Now let's see if you, if you reduce or mutate these genes, if you can convert this one into a, a compound leaf. It is because these genes are very important and they induce, they induce the simplicity uh, and this induces the compoundness. We have already seen that if you overexpress this, the tomato leaf becomes more compound. Now, this is a wild type uh, tomato leaf. You make a dominant TCP gene. Look what happens. It's simple now. So when the TCP gene acts over time or more, a compound tomato leaf can be converted into simple tomato leaf. Okay. I told you that when the NOx1 gene, that is stemness gene, is overexpressed into the tomato, it becomes super compound. In this background, you express this dominant TCP genes, now it has become simple. So even though the NOx gene is expressing over, over, you know, overloaded here in this and make a super compound, in this, you can have a dominant TCP, now it is converted into simple. That means the TCP is actually regulating the NOx genes. So it, it's, you know, it, it, it's encouraging to see that TCP actually is, uh, is upstream to NOx gene, and it is probably suppressing this one, NOx1, into this region. So let's convert, try to convert the Arabidopsis simple leaf into compound by reducing the TCP. So first you ex reduce the TCP, let's see what happens. So this is um, leaf, uh, this is a, a shoot apical meristem, SAM here in Arabidopsis, and new leaves are coming out. You see where TCPs are expressed? Only in the leaf, right? Where the NOx genes are not expressed. I showed you the NOx genes are expressed here, the stemness genes are expressed here. And the, the NOx2 genes are expressed also in the leaf. So basically, TCP and NOx2 in the leaf and NOx1 in the meristem. And they don't like each other, they fight each other. And the boundary is maintained by the uh, CUC genes. 
if you suppress all these or mutate all these TCP genes, this is a wild type Arabidopsis. And if you reduce the TCP genes, it doesn't really become compound. It becomes a little bit of serrated and all at the, at, the, at the margin, but it's not compound. So this gene, that means the TCP genes are not sufficient to make it compound because uh, 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 complex. Because when you remove the TCP gene, even then it is simple, right? So that is not the uh, only one. You reduce the NOx gene, reduce the, there are total five NOx genes, reduce three or four of them, you see, it is still simple. Maybe it is lobed, but it is still simple. So that means together, of only TCP genes is not sufficient to make it simple because when you don't have them, it is not compound. Only NOx2 genes are not sufficient because when you don't have them, they are still not compound. Now you, what you do is you reduce both of them together. Mind you, five TCP genes is down-regulated here. Three NOx genes are down-regulated here. Now what do you do? You cross the two. When you cross the two, all eight genes will go down. Now let's see whether the simple Arabidopsis leaf can be converted into a compound leaf. So this is a 30-day-old wild-type Arabidopsis leaf, simple, mature. No change will go on. In another month, it will become yellow and it will fall off, right? Because Arabidopsis grows only for about 60 days and the plant dies. Now, you reduce the all eight genes, 5 TCP and 3 NOx2 genes. The, at 19 days, it looks like a leaf, simple leaf, but you see something start growing at that. You don't see that in the in the young. Uh, uh, by 19 days, the Arabidopsis wild type Arabidopsis leaf is already mature. It is not only making one, uh, uh, you know, axillary leaf or one leaflet. It has started making a second one also. Wait for some more time. This is a 30 day. It is branching. Branching happens only in the stem, but you see it branches one branch. This is the secondary branch. This is the tertiary branch, and this is the quaternary branch. So it is branches and branches and branches and branches, right? What is the property of one branch making another branch? So that another branch also will make another branch. So it will sell, it's like a self repeating, right? And branches and branches. So this is a 30 day old. So one uh, 30 day old wild type, simple, and 30 day old leaf where eight genes are down regulated. Now it is no longer simple, it is compound. It doesn't stop here, it continues to grow. And this is a 60 day old single Arabidopsis leaf. And this is where the TCP is active. This is where TCP is not active. NAT also is not active. Uh, sorry, NOx2. Both are not active. And here, NOx2 are not active, but TCPs are active. So both are needed to downregulate. So you see, this is a single Arbitopsis leaf, and comp you compare with this one. It has become a dramatically hyperbranched compound. Not only that, the biomass is much more trying hard to put some you know, application aspect in it, even though that's not my uh, objective. And this is a 145 day old single Arbidopsis leaf. Look at this. And these are actually leaves. Still new leaves are coming out here because if you do a scanning electron micrograph of this one, and you can see that these are actually leaves. I don't know, it's not probably seeing it very well, but these are actually leaves. New leaf, new, you can see the new cell division is going on and new leaves are coming out. So Arbidopsis plant, by and large, they mature and die at 60 day old. These plants, we grew up to six months, 175 days, and the leaves are still making new leaves. At the, it makes the same number of leaves, all right, but the leaves branches and branches and branches. I think I told you earlier that it's a stem that it should do it, right? The branch and branch and branch or, and make a self similar structure. But now the leaf has started doing, but it's doing in two dimensions, it's not doing in three dimensions. So uh, it's not quite stem. It is still leaf, but it has one step taken, one step back in evolution and started branching as the stem is supposed to do. Is it really the, the NOx2 genes, uh, NOx1 genes are ectopically expressed here, as we uh, saw in the uh, simple structure, uh, compound leaf structure? I will show you that one. Okay, this I already, yeah, this is the one that I showed you scanning a micrograph. New leaves are coming out at the, uh, at the axil of this one. Anyway, so um, what does it mean? It means that loss of TCP and NOx2, not individual. Only TCP doesn't make convert it to a compound. Only NOx doesn't uh, NOx2 doesn't convert, convert it to compound. TCP and NOx2, they, it uh, converts in a uh, simple leaf into compound leaf. That means both the TCP and NOx2 genes have been added to the uh, compound leaf to ensure that it stays simple. So you see, the you know, simple is not really very simple. 
staying simple is not easy in, in life also. So we wanted to know whether the genes that is expressed in the meristem, they are now ectopically expressed into the leaf or not. What does ectopic mean? In wrong place, right? In wild type, it is expressed here. If you have a mutant where it is expressing in a wrong place, it's called ectopic expression. So we wanted to know whether the NOX1 genes are ectopically expressed in the leaves or not. So for that, everybody does RNA-seq. So we also thought that we'll do RNA-seq. We take the total transcriptome in wild type, compare that with the total transcriptome of this messed up leaf that I compound leaf that I showed, and then see whether some of the genes which are expressed in the meristem is now expressing into that. Because this is easy. So we make some RNA and send it to the company and they'll give you the thousands of you know, transcripts. Uh, and uh, if you can make sense of it, which the and informaticists here in your department uh, do, uh, you can actually get some very interesting data, which we are not uh, you know, capable of. So what we did is we uh, saw that what are the genes which are upregulated in the mutant where only TCP is down. Here only TCP is down. Some, these many genes are upregulated and these many genes are downregulated compared to the wild type in only TCP is down. This is only NOX2 is down, down, these many. Okay, number can be anything. But in the leaf where both TCP and the NOX2 are down, these many genes are upregulated, these many genes are downregulated, and it is quite interesting when you analyze them. What I'm saying is that these many genes are upregulated compared to wild type in the, the compound leaf, and these many genes are downregulated. Analyze them. This is the analysis. This is wild type. Red means high expression. Green means low expression. Somebody in Caltech made a list of genes that is expressed only in the mature leaf. A list of genes which is expressed only in the young leaf. A list of genes which is expressed only in the meristem. A list of genes which is only required for the cell division. So on and so forth. Okay. So we took those genes and analyzed them. These are the mature leaf specific genes. Okay, each line, horizontal line here is one gene. And there are some 2000 genes here. These genes are very high in mature leaf of Columbia uh, called zero plant. This is 30 day old leaf is mature. And the mature leaf should be high anyway, right? Because it's the mature leaf specific genes. However, those genes are heavily down regulated into this messed up leaf that I talked about, this compound leaf. Take the third one, this one, right? So it is like almost like a negative and positive of a photograph, isn't it? Mature leaves are very uh, specific genes are very high in wild type at the same age of leaf that they are very low because they are not mature, they're immature. What are they? Look at the young leaf specific genes. These are the genes which is up in wild type and down in uh, uh, wild type, young leaf specific genes. The situation is exactly opposite here in this compound leaf. So it is not mature, it is staying immature. So not only it looks, uh, uh, you know, compound and immature, even at the genetic level also, transcriptome level also, it has not matured yet because it's growing and growing and growing. Look at the cell division gene. Cell division genes, this is the you know, situation of the cell division gene in the mature leaf, uh, in the wild type, and this is exactly opposite into the, uh, in, into the compound leaf. These are the stem cell genes. L some genes are low, some genes are high. It's exactly opposite into this. So what is happening in this compound leaf, some part of the uh, you know stem cell like genes are so it's basically in character it is more young leaf and stem cell like it has is not maturing because it's the TCP and NOX2 which was actually giving it the mature. Not only that the stem cell genes are opposite, some of the cell division genes are expressing in in this uh, compound leaf. This is the cell division gene called cyclin B1. Where does it express? Whenever cells are dividing. So will it express in the in the mature leaf? No, because cells are all divided, right? It will not mature. However, so you see in this 30-day old wild type leaf, cyclin is not expressed. Only TCP down regulated is not expressed. Only NAT NOX2 down regulated is not expressed. But when both the type of genes are not expressed, the leaf keeps branching and cyclin keeps coming again and again. After some time, it will go. This it will go, uh, you know, disappear. And when another branch comes again, it will disappear. So whenever there is a new branch comes, the cyclin gene is, is appearing. Remember I told you that there's a, uh, th there's a boundary gene which makes sure between the mature and immature region there's a boundary, cup gene. So whenever this new leaflet is coming or leaf is branching in the mutant, does it mean that the boundary gene is also coming out? Because this is the mature and this is a new leaf is coming out, new organ, that means it's immature. In between there should be cup gene should be coming out. 
cuck gene is not expressed later in the leaf. You see, this is a almost a one millimeter long wild type leaf. This is the tip and this is the base. Cuck is there at the base early on, but one millimeter leaf. When it is 1.5 millimeter to 2 millimeter, it's almost gone. When it is 4 to 5 millimeter, this much, there is cuck is not there. This is the wild type expression pattern. The cuck expresses it the same way, only TCP, Jordi is the name. Jordi means all the five TCPs are down. If all five TCPs are down, it's pretty similar to this one. See, when it is 4 to 5 millimeter, it's not there. The NOX2 is down regulated. This is NOX2 down regulated. At a later stage, when it is 4 to 5 millimeter, it's gone. So CUC is expressed when the single group of gene is down regulated, either TCP group or uh, NOX2. CUC is not maintained. However, when both of these are down regulated, which is the TCP genes and NAT, uh, NOX2 genes, we call it JK mock leaf, which is a compound leaf. You see the CUC keeps uh, uh, you know, uh, appearing again and again wherever there is a branch. So there's a branch, it is there in the boundary. There's another branch, it comes to the boundary. So not only the cell division genes are coming up into the leaf, is the boundary genes are also coming up or the line of control genes are actually appearing again and again and again for about six months when the new leaves are being, uh, being initiated. And this expression of this boundary gene or CUC2 is required. How do you know? This is the wild type. This is the compound messed up leaf that I told you. In this background, mutate the CUC2, the boundary gene, it leaves look the leaf looks like that. That means the fact that you are getting this branching and branching and branching is cuck dependent. It is branching because cuck is functional here. When we mutate the cuck in this background, leaf comes back to the. So cuck is required for it, it is a downstream gene. So what is happening now till now? In the wild type, you had a strong TCP function and NOX2 function. It was not letting the NOX1 gene express into this one. And this boundary gene also is only at the base for a very short time. When both the genes are gone, uh, the boundary genes is pushed here and being expressed again and again every time it branches. The question is, does NOX1 gene is also ectopically expressed in this leaf or not? You can do very easily by reporter gene. You take the NOX promoter, clone the GUS gene, and then see whether it is expressed here. In wild type, NOX1 is not expressed in the leaf at all. I showed you before. So before that, what you did is we did that there, because there are several NOX genes are there. There are about five NOX genes are there. So we did a RTQ-PCR. You know what is RTQ-PCR is, right? Reverse transcriptase quantitative PCR as to see whether in the wild type and in this compound leaf, whether these five NOX genes are expressed in the leaf or not. So this is one of the gene. This is another gene. This is another, another. All these are meristem genes. So you only compare the blue, which is wild type, and this is NAT2, which is one of the NOX1 genes. This is NAT6, another NOX1. Uh, this is NAT6, is another NOX1 gene. So compared to wild type, NAT2 is expressed some three times into the compound leaf, and some six times NAT6, which is another NOX, NOX1 genes, uh, higher in this. So the genes like NOX1 genes like NAT2 and these are all just names, NAT2 and NAT6, both are NOX1 genes or the meristem gene. When you make the gene, the leaf compound, these NAT2 and NAT6 are expressing in the leaf now, at least as far as the uh, uh, RTQ PCR is concerned. Check with the these two, check with the, uh, the reporter gene. This is a wild type leaf. And you see at the margin, the NAT2 does not express. NAT6 also does not express because they don't express in the leaf at all. However, in this compound leaf that I'm talking about, they come in as a dot wherever there is a branching is happening. You can see here, I don't know what you can see here. There's one leaf is one leaflet here and at the at the uh, boundary, there's a dot of the NOX2, NOX1 gene is, ex is expressed. You see this one, wherever there is a branch here, there is one here. There is another uh, leaflet, there is one here. There's another leaflet is one here. So wherever there's a branch coming, so these genes are actually not supposed to express in the leaf. But now that you have down-regulated two differentiation genes from the leaf, but eight total, five TCP and, uh, uh, and three uh, uh, NOX2, now these guys are expressing ectopically here. Where is it expressing? Only where there is a branch is happening. Not only the boundary gene, CUC2 is expressing, the, no the NOX1 gene is also expressing. And it keeps on expressing for six months, seven months, as long as it, is, it keeps on branching. And they are actually, uh, you know, the meristem activity is induced here because if we leave this compound leaf for too long, uh, 
like five, five months, six months. Sometimes from this axil, a new meristem comes out, and this is an inflorescence. This is actually a, a flower here. So leaf is producing flower here. Why? Because the stemness genes, which is supposed to be restricted only in the stem cell, now it is expressing into the leaf. Right. And if it, the stemness gene is there, the new meristem will be formed. If new meristem will be formed, then new uh, uh, inflorescence will come out. So usually what is the uh, uh, the uh, the inflorescence is produced of out of which organ? Stem, never leaf, right? Except begonia and others. Uh, but here it is the leaf is actually showing uh, stem stem property because now it is converted into par partially stem. So our, I don't know how long it has been, uh, but uh, so this is our model. OK, so think about whether this model is correct or not, and you can give your suggestion uh, if it is, uh, if it can't support all the data or the data can't support the model. So this is a leaf, wild type leaf. Early on, some cuck genes are expressed here is the boundary, cuck is boundary, little bit very early on and later disappears. Some leaflet like uh, organ is formed here, but they don't grow. They stay, they grow a little bit and make a tiny serration. Remember the wild type leaf that I showed you before? So a little bit of serration is there, but it does not make a leaflet. And that is because the Nox one and Cuck are restricted only in the meristem and does not express into this one. And why is it? This TCPs, five TCPs and two Nox, uh, th th three Nox genes, they are very strong differentiation factor. Together, they ensure that these Nox1 genes and Cuck genes and other people have shown that one promotes the other. Imagine one is pro A is promoting B, B is promoting A. That means very quickly they'll be very high. No, the uh, expression will be very high. But this uh, positive feedback loop is efficiently suppressed by these two genes. And that's why this does not grow out as a new leaflet. What happens if you both of them are downregulated? If you downregulate both of them, then this gets activated. Nox1 promotes Cuck, Cuck promotes Nox. Where do they express? Nox is here, Cuck is in the boundary. Okay, But in the overlapping, overlapping region, they promote each other. And because now the Nox1 and Cuck is expressed in, into the leaf, it makes one branch, it makes another branch, that makes another branch, it goes on and on and on. It's like I'm making myself. If I make myself, then the second one will make another one because that's the property. That's what the fractal is called. And in this background, when we induced a dominant TCP, uh, it, you can get back to the simple leaf. So both have to be downregulated. Only one is not enough. Such situations are there in the nature. So what have we done? We have converted the leaf into one step back into the evolution. A leaf has now, which, which was a simple structure here, is now is a branch structure because that is the, the ancestral structure of the, of the stem. So at least to, the, to a small extent, uh, this shows that leaf indeed originated uh, from the uh, from the uh, stem, as the Zimmerman uh, said in his Tillon theory. Such uh, structural diversity is present in some species within the same plant. For example, if you take, for example, coriander, right? This is the coriander, just like Arabidopsis, it makes a, a rosette structure. And after some time, after a few days, like 63 days here, this stem cell, which is right here, will grow, it's called bolting, and make few more leaves, and it will make the flower here. You see the first leaf is simple, and then it becomes compound, more compound, more compound, and so on and so forth. If I dissect all the leaves here and take some nice picture, as one of my students have taken, this is the two cotyledons, embryonic leaf, the leaves made are mother plant. This is the leaf which is made on this plant that I showed you. This is a simple leaf, it's not really compound yet. Now it is compound because this has been separated by this one here. This is even more compound. This is even more. So compoundness is increasing as you go from first leaf, second leaf, third leaf, fourth leaf. And this leaf is really, really compound. This reminds me of the mutant that I was talking about, the Arabidopsis mutant, that is branches and branches, not as much as the mutant. The mutant has forgotten that it has to stop growing. So it grows and grows and grows and grows. So it's almost like an, right? Uh, you you know you made a leaf which which uh, grows forever. Uh, it to some extent does that. It branches and branches and branches to some two three times, but it stops uh, ultimately. So now is it possible that the gene or the genetic module that I have told you about 
NOX1, NOX2, TCP, CUC, and all those genes. Is it possible that those genes are expressing, NOX1 genes are expressing more and more in the higher uh, uh, leaf, the second leaf, third leaf, fourth leaf, fifth leaf, and that's why it is becoming, and suddenly it, uh, uh, hyperactivity of the NOX1, that's why it becomes compound. Well, you have to test it. That whatever is happening in the mutant arbidopsis may be happening in the, uh, in, in the natural plant uh, at different developmental stages. How do you uh, test this one? You isolate those NOx genes and TCB genes and so on and so forth. And first you reduce the TCB gene and see that these will become hyper compound like that. You increase TCB gene, you will see that you can't knock out, knock out the NOx1 genes huh? because NOx1 genes are stemness genes. So they are required for the meristem activity. If meristem does, is not active, there will be no leaf at all. So you can't really totally you know, knock out the NOx1 genes. So if you uh, ectopically express NOx1 genes, maybe this uh, uh, compound leaf will be hyper, hyper compound. This has to be tested. So uh, this is what we'd like to do uh, in, in future and then see that the molecular module that you identified in a model plant like Arabidopsis is operative in a natural plant, which has compound and simple leaf in, its, in, in the same individual. And uh, it's the same mechanism. If it's the same mechanism, TCP and NOx, that means that this is a module which is which was innovated in evolution long ago, and it is the same thing is conserved in in different species, which is usually the case because the developmental modules or the gene pathways were innovated very few times, and they have been distributed in all the genomes or all the species uh, because. After all, all the species share uh, uh, an ancestral species in evolution, as Darwin uh, told you. Now, uh, I would like uh, these guys to thank me because there is on their behalf, I'm presenting their work because I did none of this. And uh, it's uh, Krishna who did the major work who is not here and Mona Lisa because they have gone for postdoc. Uh, this is a lab that is more recent and uh, there are a few more students who are not there. I will stop here. And uh, I just wanted to tell you that um, ask questions is very important. If you don't ask questions, there's nothing to study. You may not be able to answer. For example, there's no risk in asking questions. The risk is on my side. I may, may, I may not know the answer. That doesn't matter, but ask questions. Thanks, sir, first time. Good evening, sir. First time, I'm David. I'm studying the first PG, Molecular Biology and Biotechnology. Okay. Uh, the Arabidopsis plant is oh, totally 60 days plant. Arabidopsis plant is totally 60 days lifespan. Yeah, it's roughly the, that, yes. Yeah, more over 60 days. How it turns to 175 days that much? Three times longer than that. Yeah, that's actually an interesting question. Because if it grows for 60 days, that means after two months, even the meristem senescence, right? This plant, the mutant, not only it has different leaf structure, it flowers also much later. It flowers almost three months, four months uh, uh, at, at the age of four months. So these genes not only regulate the leaf architecture, it also regulates the flowering time. You know that in plants like Arabidopsis rice and all, is the same meristem which is making leaf today will make flower later on, right? It's the same meristem. How does it do it? Because there is a group of genes which makes sure that initially it is vegetative meristem. Later on, the identity of the meristem changes to the inflorescence meristem, right? So they're the same <coughs> structure. Today, vegetative meristem. Tomorrow, it is inflorescence meristem. It's almost like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You know, the two different identity of, of the same individual. So that transition determines when the plant flowers. If it is transition is early, it is early flowering. If the transition is delayed, then it keeps on making leaf and flowers later on. This mutant plant not only has a different leaf structure, but it also flowers late. So that means these genes are involved in other processes as well, for example, flowering transition. That's why it grow, uh, keeps making uh, leaf till that long. So the leaves are too small. It's enough for the plant to grow. There is a large stems. So these mutant leaves are much bigger, much bigger than wild type, right? Yes, the leaves are too small. No, leaves are much bigger. Compared to wild type, it is it is bigger. There are more branches. Nah, so right, you you are right, you are right. Uh, so that's that's another point that you good that you noticed. But uh, the total biomass is more, okay? But mostly they are midrib. 
the lamina is small you are correct and that is because one of the property of the stemness genes which is the nox1 genes or stem cell genes are to produce new organ but suppress uh, laminar growth so because the nox1 genes are ectopically expressed in the leaf they they help in branching but the lamina is reduced so yes you are right that's another so i mean same gene can have multiple functions so yes thank you sir. you are correct very good you know there's a book written by peter medawar peter medawar is a nobel laureate in immunology who actually did that the grafting graft acceptance or rejection for the first time he wrote a book called advice to the young scientist and there he said many people ask me can i do a phd am i capable of doing phd or not i told them the only thing that you know, need to do phd is common sense and dante you heard about dante dante is a italian uh, philosopher long ago dante once said that common sense is the most equally distributed wealth in this world everybody had it, has it almost to the same extent the difference is in using all you need is common sense and uh, so peter medower said that i'll give you a very simple test whether you can you know you can use common sense or not what is that so he said he gave an example there's a guy called um, a painter called el greco european painter e l greco g r e c h o <clears throat> el greco did i say something wrong okay El Greco used to paint, but his painting was very characteristic. Is unusually long, so he will draw a face, but not like this. Is like this. It will remain same, but this will become like that. All his paintings are like that. Even trees he draw, but unusually long. So some people are discussing why did he do that. And one eye doctor, ophthalmologist, he says, I know. Maybe he saw them like that. you are sitting and nodding your head suppose i have some eye disease and i am seeing you this long right with the same but length is double i'll paint like that only this is the explanation he gave peter medewar's question is do you think this is a reasonable explanation common sense no actually because if i see you like this i'll draw like this after looking at drawing after looking at my drawing i'll see it like that no because whatever i saw i saw it longer so if your dimension is 2 is to 1 i'll see it 4 is to 1 i'll draw 4 is to 1 looking at my painting i'll see it is 8 is to 1 then you'll see it's not the same thing what there's 4 is to 1 here my painting is 8 is to 1 so it's not matching so explanation is incorrect right so that is like as simple common sense as that so yeah doing phd is fun so welcome aboard if you want to do it as i said that given a chance i would like to do one more uh, good evening sir uh, so it was a very nice presentation and um, i have a one i have one question that um, the mutant which you shown um, which survived for 145 days so did you observe any uh, did you observe any uh, effect on the root system since the canopy has grown large so how does how did the plant survive like there must be some effect on the root system to make the plant to make the large uh, canopy survive so i will uh, repeat your question you are saying that since they have grown for 5 6 months their above ground canopy must have grown larger whether correspondingly the root canopy also increased is that what your question is uh, yes sir like how did uh, the plant survived Um, good, good whether good there is a change because, change in a root question. system or yeah because with the wild type level of root architecture you may not uh, see the uh, that th these plants will survive for that long right so whether yes, the root also correspondingly changed or not yes, i don't know we can go back and try i think okay. i got too much carried away with this looking at this leaf uh, uh, structure but we can go back and uh, try uh, try that but very reasonable question that unless there is a because there is always a corresponding 
uh, growth change. If the shoot changes, root changes. If the root changes, shoot changes. Because shoot is the auxin is made by the shoot and sent to the root and regulates root architecture. Cytokinin is made in the root and sent up in the shoot and regulates shoot architecture. So they each one is regulating the other. So uh, it is likely that uh, the root architecture also will change in the plate. So what we do is we grow these seeds in the plate for about 15, 20 days, and then we transfer to the soil and they grow them into the soil for the rest of their life. But uh, up to the 14, 15 days, we did not see any change in the root architecture. But later on, it might change underground. And uh, I did not go underground. But it would be it would be interesting to do that. Good question. So good evening to all again. So I feel honored and uh, privileged to get the opportunity to propose a vote of thanks. And uh, on behalf of CPMB, uh, I will convey deep records and sincere records to our uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Madam, for her encouragement in conducting uh, this kind of lectures or endowment lectures and special guest lectures to the students. And uh, uh, like uh, we don't have words to enough, uh, in, not enough to thank her for her constant guidance, support and uh, motivation in all of our activities. And uh, our special thanks to uh, the guest speaker of today's lecture, Dr. Rodpal Nath uh, from Bengaluru for his uh, uh, inspirational talk that is on uh, keeping it simple, genetic regulation of complexity in organ shape. So really you made it very simple and uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Utpal. Uh, our thanks to uh, Dr. Sindhil, Director CPMB, uh, Dean uh, and uh, Dean uh, School of Postgraduate Studies, for his constant support uh, to conduct this uh, lecture. Our uh, thanks to uh, Dean SPGS for his financial support in conducting this lecture. I also like to thank all the university officers, HODs who have joined through offline as well as through online. And uh, my sincere thanks to Dr. Raghu, coordinator of uh, PG program, and also uh, Dr. Kritika for involvement in various activities for conducting this lecture. Uh, I would like to thank all the senior faculty members of CPMB uh, in attending this guest lecture, and also to all the student friends who are like physiology, plant breeding and genetics, as well as students who have joined through online for attending this lecture. So I thank once again to all of you. Thank you.